Coming up on this Thursday edition of Newsline at Noon, the two Koreas agreed to resume later this month reunions of families separated since the Korean War in what could be the first step in mending their ties. President Park re-emphasises the need to radically streamline red tape and overhaul the public sector as she spells out the major goals of her second year in office. Plus, the UN denounces the Vatican for concealing child sex abuse and urges Pope Francis to immediately remove all clergy known or suspected of child abuse. These stories are more on Newsline at Noon. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Newsline at noon. I'm Choi Yusan in Seoul. Very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. And we start with the very welcome news that the two Koreas finally have reached an agreement on a new round of reunions for families separated since the Korean War. Well, everyone agrees this is a step in the right direction. The question now is whether the much-anticipated humanitarian event can serve as a starting point for rosier inter-Korean ties. Our Hwang Sung-hee has the details. Will the resumption of reunions for divided families pave the way for improved relations between the two Koreas? South Korean President Park Geun-hye expressed her hopes via her spokesperson on Thursday that the humanitarian event could open up a new era of inter-Korean relations. We hope the upcoming reunions will be a starting point for improved inter-Korean relations and serve as a foundation for opening up an era of reunification, bringing peace and cooperation to the Korean Peninsula. Wednesday's agreement to resume family reunions from February 20th to the 25th came as a surprise to many, as it was reached in less than five hours of talks. What's more surprising is that the dates overlap with South Korea's joint military drills with Washington. North Korea had earlier warned the reunions could not take place amid gunfire, but the upcoming drills were not a major issue during the talks. There was no specific mention by North Korea of the South Korea-U.S. joint military drills, nor a call for the military exercises to be canceled during the talks. South Korea said it views the latest agreement as a positive sign. Pyongyang has been cranking up its peace offensive this year, although many have questioned the regime's motives. The Koreas left open the possibility of further cooperation, promising additional rounds of talks after the reunions to discuss a wide range of humanitarian issues that could include South Korean food aid to the north. But despite the friendlier tone, an air of skepticism lingers, as North Korea has a history of breaking its promises, including its last-minute cancellation of a round of family reunions just last year. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. A group of lawmakers in the House, U.S. House of Representatives have sent a message to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un urging Pyongyang to allow hundreds of thousands of Korean Americans in the U.S. to also reunite with their long-lost relatives in the North. The four lawmakers, including Democrat Charles Rangel from New York, also called for the immediate release of Korean American Kenneth Bae, who has been detained in the North for over a year on charges of planning to overthrow the regime. The U.S. lawmakers said Pyongyang had done the right thing by releasing Merrill Newman, an 85-year-old Korean war veteran detained for a few weeks late last year and asked the North to make further progress on the humanitarian front by letting Bae go free. President Park Geun-hye is kicking off her second year in office with a series of status reports from government ministries this week with the security-related ministries in the hot seat today. At the Defense Ministry in Seoul, where the Foreign Unification and Defense Ministries uh, briefed the president on their policy goals for the year. On denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula, the Foreign Ministry emphasized bilateral cooperation with neighboring countries such as China and Russia and its traditional ally, the United States, while using multilateral pressure to engage with North Korea. The Unification Ministry will also aim to create sustainable inter-Korean and policies through dialogue and cooperation and lay the groundwork for reunification with the North. 
The defense ministry will strengthen its ability to react to nuclear threats and prepare for the transfer of wartime operational control from the U.S. to South Korea. And now for more on the status reports, President Park is stressing the need for bold deregulation to stimulate economic growth, telling officials to uproot abnormal practices in society. Our Shin Se-min has the details. President Park Geun-hye is demanding the government step up its game to deregulate the economy and to overturn abnormal practices and policies. Kicking off a series of annual policy briefings from government agencies at the presidential office of Cheongwadae on Wednesday, the president ordered ministries to determine the difficulties companies are facing and devise methods to help them by capping the number of regulations placed on them. She also urged the Office of Government Policy Coordination to have the spirit of the Jindo, a breed of hunting dog from Korea that won't let go until it removes a piece of flesh. 작은 과제 하나라도 비정상의 뿌리가 뽑힐 때까지 끝까지 그 추진해 나가는 것이 중요합니다. President Park also told government agencies to fully concentrate on drastically reforming regulations holding businesses back so the economy has room to flourish. She also stressed the need to correct lax management and establish laws to eradicate corruption. The president also spoke about hundreds of economy-related bills sitting the National Assembly, saying all the efforts put into drafting them will count for nothing without Parliament's support. The policy reports will run through February 24th, with President Park scheduled to receive a total of nine policy reports from over 20 government ministries, commissions and agencies. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. A candidate nomination system took center stage on the first day of the four-day hearing at the National Assembly on this Thursday. Lawmakers from the two main rival parties debated over whether to scrap a system in which political parties nominate candidates for local elections, a campaign pledge made by both ruling and opposition presidential candidates back in 2012. The main opposition Democratic Party is demanding President Park fulfill her pledge to abolish the system, saying that the ruling party is reneging on the pledge because of its own political interests ahead of local elections on June 4th. The ruling Senate Party argues that getting rid of the system could do more harm than good and suggested that adopting an open primary may be the best way to give the public a chance to, to nominate candidates. The United States says North Korea has started developing its own road mobile intercontinental ballistic missile. Director of National Intelligence James Clapper said in his annual, latest annual unclassified worldwide threat assessment, the missile, the KN-08, could be capable of hitting parts of the continental U.S., although it remains untested. Experts in the U.S. are divided on whether Clapper's claim gives weight to whether Pyongyang is inching closer to developing a fully operational ICBM that can carry a miniaturized nuclear weapon. Then U.S. Forces Korea Commander Army General James Thurman said in October last year that North Korea's continued desire to develop long-range missiles is apparent in any case. And the United States has retained its position as the top military spender in the world, even as spending on defense last year dropped worldwide. In its annual report on military spending, the International Institute for Strategic Studies said the U.S. spent over 600 billion U.S. dollars on defense in 2013, followed by China with 112 billion dollars and Russia with 68 billion. Saudi Arabia and the U.K. followed them. South Korea ranked 11th with $32 billion. The institute said military budgets shrank around the globe last year, but the uh, U.S. and many European countries are steadily scaling back their military spending as well. But uh, Russia and countries in Asia and the Middle East are in fact investing more. The institute also said defence spending is expected to rise overall for the first time in five years this year, mainly due to the soaring budgets of China and Russia. 
Now, on a much lighter note, we're just wrapping up the Lunar New Year holiday, and it's over this extended break that even more Chinese tourists than usual made the short hop across the West Sea to Korea. Looking to capitalize on the extra numbers, local businesses are pulling out all the stops to entice Chinese people to buy their goods and services. Connie Lee has more. Signs written out in Chinese and friendly Ni Hao greetings now fill the streets of a major shopping district in downtown Seoul. Everyone is so friendly here. Workers and guides speak English, so it's easy to get around and buy stuff. These are all efforts to cater to Chinese tourists, who for the first time outnumbered the number of Japanese tourists to Korea last year. We're seeing a surge of Chinese tourists mainly because of China's rapid economic development, so more Chinese people want to travel overseas. Also distance-wise, China is not that far from Korea, and the visa rules for Chinese tourists visiting Korea eased. So Korean businesses are taking notice and are getting a bit creative to attract the Chinese guests. At a duty-free shop, coupons are offered inside Chinese-style red envelopes, and special giveaways are rewarded to Chinese shoppers who don't mind the long waits in line to buy their favorite Korean products. I waited in line for 45 minutes. I just bought four boxes of Solasu skincare set. We targeted Japanese tourists more before, but now we have more promotional events and targeted marketing campaigns for Chinese visitors. And a four-star hotel in southern Seoul recently hired Chinese-speaking employees and has dedicated an entire floor just for its Chinese guests. We've seen the number of Chinese clients at our hotel increase by 30 to 40 percent over the past two years or so. The hotel also added a new dining menu to please the palates and increase the luck of Chinese tourists. In China, the number eight is associated with prosperity and wealth, so it's considered a lucky number. So that's why this restaurant has created a special menu just for its Chinese guests. Now all the dishes on that menu include eight different ingredients or have been cooked for eight minutes. And the price of each specialty dish? 38000 801. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And most of those Chinese tourists will have come to Korea via Incheon International Airport. And the Korean government has decided to transform a large plot of reclaimed land near the nation's main airport into a tourist and leisure complex. The complex, called Dream Island, will host shopping malls, theme parks and golf courses and is slated for completion by 2020. Kim Min-ji has the details. This is Yeongjongdo Island, located off of Korea's western port city of Incheon. Just 10 minutes away from Incheon International Airport, the nation's main gateway, Yeongjongdo is the site of a new tourism and leisure complex called Dream Island that will be built here by 2020. With an area of over 3 million square meters, the complex will accommodate luxury hotels, shopping malls, theme parks, golf courses, and is expected to draw millions of tourists each year. The project is part of the government's three-year economic innovation plan to boost domestic demand and raise the employment rate. The project, which is expected to cost about 2.2 billion U.S. dollars, will be spearheaded by World Hansang Dream Island, a Korean and Japanese consortium, which will invest roughly $715 million. The Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries plans to start work on the project in the second half of next year. Dream Island meets the conditions for becoming an international tourist hub because it is easily accessible by tourists coming from Seoul, Gyeonggi-do province and Incheon International Airport. The government expects the project to create 18,000 jobs for an economic effect valued at $25 billion. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. <laughs> For your fill of Korean and international news, join Che Yu Sun and Mark Broom every weekday at lunchtime. Newsline at noon. Plenary session this Wednesday and vote on the government restructuring bills. 
The United Nations has denounced the Vatican for adopting policies it says allowed priests to sexually abuse thousands of children over a period of decades. Hwang Jie has the details. The UN Committee on the Rights of the Child issued a scathing report on Wednesday saying church officials kept quiet about child sex abuse to protect the reputation of the church. The UN body's exceptionally blunt paper also demanded the Vatican immediately remove all clergy accused of child abuse and turn them over to civil authorities. Another matter was the code of silence that was imposed by the church on children and the fact that reporting to national law enforcement authorities has never been made compulsory. The Vatican responded by saying it's committed to defending and protecting the rights of the child. The church complained that it had already introduced many of the changes called for in the report and that the report's conclusions were not up to date. Responding to criticisms about the Vatican's opposition to homosexuality, contraception and abortion, the church said the world body was trying to interfere with the Catholic Church's teaching and in the exercise of religious freedom. Sex abuse victims, however, welcome the UN's report. I've been very touched by the uh, recommendations and the conclusions of the report because I feel very validated. The UN's report called on the Vatican to report back on its progress in 2017. Although the recommendations are not compulsory, the committee expects Pope Francis and the Holy See to act on them. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. The opening ceremony for the 2014 Sochi Winter Olympics is now just a little over a day away. Athletes from around the world are arriving and it seems so far so good security-wise. However, with the threat of terrorism hovering over the Games, the U.S. has sent two warships on standby to the Black Sea. Our Connie Kim reports. Ending its four-month journey of climbing mountains, plunging into a lake, and even making its first journey into space on a Russian spacecraft, the Olympic flame is now in Sochi, signaling the 2014 Games are just around the corner. Team Korea, boasting its biggest squad in Olympics history, held a welcoming ceremony at the Olympic Village on Wednesday, vowing once again to finish in the top 10 in the medal count for the third consecutive Winter Games. However, with security fears rising, the United States has positioned two warships in the Black Sea as a means of protection against potential terrorist attacks. The U.S. Navy says the USS Mount Whitney and the USS Ramage will be in the area to respond to any emergencies during the Olympics. Equipped with machine guns, rockets and anti-ship missiles, the ships could transport supplies to around 3,000 people in case of emergency evacuation. Also, the U.S. has warned airlines with direct flights to Russia to be aware of the possibility of explosives hidden inside toothpaste or skincare product containers. Russia has banned passengers from carrying any liquid and carry-on luggage during the games. Meanwhile, Russian security forces have killed the suspected mastermind of recent suicide bombings on public transportation services in the southern city of Volgograd. Russian state media reported Wednesday that Zamaldin Mirzaev was shot dead by security forces during a house siege in Russia's restif Dagestan region. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Following a series of controversial remarks made by its management, concerns are brewing over Japanese public broadcaster NHK's neutrality and editorial integrity. Japan's Mainichi Shimbun newspaper reported on Wednesday that Michiko Hasegawa, an NHK management board member, praised the worshipping of the Japanese emperor as a living god by extreme nationalist Sunsuke Nomura in her book published in October. Nomura committed ritual suicide in 1993 in protest at a cartoon in the Asai Shimbun, which ridiculed her right-wing group. Another NHK board member has recently dismissed the 1937 Nanjing massacre as propaganda, while the new NHK chief described sexual slavery as commonplace during times of war. In a move certain to shake already fragile Middle East peace talks, Israeli officials have approved building plans for more than 550 new homes in Jewish settlements in East Jerusalem, the land Palestinians want as their capital. Israel's Jerusalem municipality said Wednesday that its planning committee had approved the construction work in three 
settlements in a part of the West Bank that Israel captured in the 1967 war and later annexed. Israel says the initial plans for the new homes were approved years ago. Palestinians are furious with the decision, saying it could derail U.S. brokered peace talks, which resumed in July last year. The expansion of Israeli settlements is considered illegal under international law. Staying in that region, and Syria has missed another deadline to hand over its chemical weapons stockpile. The internationally brokered disarmament agreement is now several weeks behind schedule. This latest missed deadline also throws into jeopardy the final June 30th deadline for Syria to completely eliminate its chemical weapons. Syrian officials blame the civil war for, delay, for the delay and say they are still committed to destroying the country's arsenal. Syria had already missed a December 31st deadline to give up its most poisonous chemical agents. Russia says Syria will start shipping more chemicals out soon, but Western countries believe no further shipments are in the pipeline at the moment. Google has tentatively settled the European antitrust probe by promising to display competitor links on its website. The deal ends a three-year investigation and means Google has avoided what could have been a multi-billion dollar fine. Under the terms of the agreement, Google will let three rivals display their logos and web links in a prominent box and content providers will be able to decide what material Google can use for its own services. Google will also scrap restrictions that prevent advertisers from moving their campaigns to rival platforms such as Yahoo's search tool and Microsoft's Bing. The deal which Google has to stick to for five years only applies to Europe. And scientists in Europe have created a bionic hand. That gives amputees a sense of touch in their fingers, opening up new possibilities for people with artificial limbs. Son Jung-in reports. Dennis Sorensen lost his left hand in a firework accident 10 years ago. After that, he thought he would never be able to feel anything with that hand again. But thanks to a revolutionary prosthetic device, he has become the first person to regain his sense of touch after being given a bionic hand. In laboratory tests, Sorensen could grasp objects, feel their weight, and tell their shape and stiffness even when he was blindfolded. The team of international robotic experts from Italy, Switzerland and Germany who carried out the project are enthusiastic about the results. The hand has several sensors attached to each tendon of each finger and we can use these sensors to understand the level of force the patient was performing while grasping an object. And we use this force information to deliver very precise stimulation to the different sensory nerves in order to restore this real-time sensory feeling into the nervous system. Ultra-thin electrodes were surgically implanted into nerves in Sorensen's upper arm. The bionic hand was then connected to the electrodes every day for a week, forming an electrical connection between the prosthetic and his brain. The international research team says the bionic hand is still a prototype and they are now working on how to miniaturize and fine-tune the sensory technology so that it can eventually become available to the general public. The details on the research project were published in the journal Science Translational Medicine on Wednesday. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Let's now get an update on the weather with our Lee at the Weather Center. Hello there, Jian. Good afternoon. Well, I don't know if either of you have had a chance to go outside since coming to work this morning, but it's much milder today. 
Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance mm. to go outside mm. today. Me too neither. busy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's good that perhaps uh, spring is on the way. It's very good news. Uh, right. Can you give us details on the weather, Gian? Sure thing, Mark. Well, temperatures will rise into the single digits in most regions, but depend on what part of country you are in. Some parts will be sunny and some parts will be cloudy. Also, it's been raining some places in Jeju and snowing in Tokyo, and parts of Gangwon-do will receive a mix of snow and rain later this evening. So you want to be prepared for that if you're going to be in any of those regions today. Now, tomorrow should be the mildest day of the week with temperatures rising to 7 degrees Celsius here in the capital. So the milder weather is on the way, but it will be short-lived that temperatures will drop a bit again on the weekend. Also, we are looking at a chance of nationwide shower on Saturday and it will be colder on Sunday. With that in mind, here are the readings for today. The afternoon high in Seoul and Gwangju will get up to 3, while Daegu and Busan will top out at 5 this afternoon. Now for other regions, it looks like Jeju will climb up to 7 in the afternoon and Daejeon will rise to 4, while the top temperature on Mount Kungang will be at minus 5. Now that's all for me today and let's send it back to Mark and Yusan in the studio. Well, thank you very much for the weather as always there, Gian, and those are the stories we're following at this hour. We'll be back tomorrow here on Newsline at noon. Join us then.